So the one thing my dad did really well, he had a group of guys that they did life together. I want to show you a picture of these guys. Uh, you have Donnie, you have Byron, known as Big B. Byron was six foot eight. He was huge. And you have Dave. And these guys did everything together. Uh, they went hunting, fishing. They worked on cars. They actually uh, built garages. It was just something that they did. They enjoyed doing things together. But not only that, it was almost like they would always stop at my house on the way home. And it was almost like Monday, Donnie would stop by. He'd talk about his day, what's coming up. And then on Tuesday, Big B would stop by and he'd do the same thing, talk about his day and what's coming up. And then you have Dave that would just come and hang out and do the same exact thing. And every now and again, they, all four of them would get together on one day and just be this huge, huge uh, conversation and just a bunch of laughs. And I remember this as a kid thinking to myself, man, I want that kind of friendship when I get older. Now, it's not just the fun stuff that they had, but they also experienced life together. Um, back in 1980, my dad's father passed away, and these three men were around my, my father during that time. Um, when my brother went off to the Navy, I remember all four of them getting together and experiencing this together. And then when I had left to pursue ministry at 18 years old, I remember hearing about these four men getting together and talking about what life looks like now. And not just for my dad, but I remember when other things happened in these men's life were pivotal moments where my dad was there for them. And I remember thinking, man, I, I so want that. So in, we're beginning this series, but actually this is the second week of this series called Better Together. And in this series, we're looking at life in community, how life is made, or how community, excuse me, is made on purpose and with a purpose. And last week, Pastor Jason kicked off the message and, or this series, and uh, he talked about the triunal God how it's God in three persons. And it's not a simple, but it is a very foundational message about you have God the Father, Jesus the Son, and you have the Holy Spirit. And how he is all connected in those ways. And since we are made in his image, we are supposed to be in community with God as well as with each other. That's how we are made. And, and so today, I want to kind of lean into how uh, Jesus in community. And we're going to look at uh, two different scenes. We're going to look at the Passover meal, so, so the Last Supper. And we're going to look at the Garden of Gethsemane and see how, how Jesus is in community with his community in those moments. And, and I also want you to kind of see how we've been doing this thing called the blessed strategy for a while now. We're going to see how this blessed strategy even is interwoven into these two stories, these two scenes. You have B with begin with prayer. And I want you as, as we open the word, you will see how Jesus begins things with prayer. Uh, you have L with listening. You have E with eating. You know, it's the last supper. So there's definitely eating that's involved. And you have S with with serve. And, and we'll, we'll find out what this last S is, but you'll see how at least these four things play a role and especially how that last one plays a role as well. So if you want to flip your Bible to John 13, that's the first part of this uh, story we're going to kind of explore. We see that Jesus is lowering himself so much to, or so much as a servant and, and washes his disciples' feet. It's crazy. He gets down to such a low level that he washes their feet. Now, now let's see this in John 13, starting in verse three. It says this, Jesus, knowing that the father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel and he tied it around his waist. Verse five, then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel that, had, that was wrapped around him. Going on, it says, he came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, what am I doing or what I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. So, 
So there's a few things here I wanna kind of pull out of the passage to kind of emphasize how Jesus or what Jesus did with his community. Number one is Jesus cared for his community. Jesus cared for his community. Jesus sets the ultimate example that relationship is bigger and better than pride. Now, uh, in, in that time, people wore sandals. That's what they used as shoes. They wore sandals and they walked around on roads that were just dirty and nasty and dusty and all that kind of stuff. And so when they would go into someone's home, someone would wash that person's feet. And typically it was a servant. They would hire a servant or maybe there was a house servant and they'd clean their feet. And there was multiple reasons why, but one of the main reasons why it was just unclean. The other thing is that where they would sit for dinner, it wasn't like a table or, or even something like this. It was really low to the ground. And so they would almost like lay and lean and their feet would be right by the table and nobody wants to eat food by nasty feet. And so the disciples knew this going into it, but, but they didn't lower themselves to wash anyone's feet. They didn't wanna do some, something such a uh, uh, degrading task. And they also didn't hire somebody to come and do it as well. Now, why would someone who is claiming to be God to do something that is so crazy? The other thing I find very mind-blowing is that Jesus chooses to wash all their feet. Every one of the disciples, every one of his community that's in that upper room, having that last meal together. Even Judas, the one that's going to betray him, the one that's going to, to turn him into the Romans offic Roman officials, uh, the Roman guards. And, and uh, like he still chooses to wash his feet, to get down on the ground to wash the betrayer's feet. Jesus knew that, but still cared enough and willing enough to care. Too often, we gauge how committed we are to somebody by the feelers they give back to us. Like um, for me, like if I'm kind of putting myself out there, trying to get to know somebody, but they seem a little distant, I'm not gonna continue to pursue them. I usually kind of stop where I'm at and, and kind of go, yeah, it's really not feeling that too much. But, but, but Jesus doesn't do this. Jesus knew how to care and he cared well. You see, he kept caring even when people were distant. Even when people were like Peter and at first resistance, like, no, no, you don't wash my feet. And Jesus like, no, no, you will understand. So then Peter goes, well, just wash my whole body then. You know, he, he just, just cleansed me. But at first he was very resistant to it. And he also chooses to wash Judas's feet, someone who rejects his love. He still lowers himself and cares for his community enough to wash a betrayer's feet. You see, Jesus' example of caring for his community, even to the point of straight humility, teaches us that no task is beneath us. No task is beneath us, especially when we're caring for our community. But it also teaches us this, is that when I love like Jesus, I persist even when others resist. I keep moving forward, even if someone's backing away. I'm there for them. I'm caring for them. I'm doing the things that no one else would do to show that I care them, for them. I need to care even when I don't feel it. And to be a community on purpose and with a purpose, we love and serve even when no one else notices. And, and even when it, we don't get anything in return. And when I look to Christ, not only did he care, but he knew his disciples would desert. He knew that at some point they're going to decide not to be with him at some point. And he still so willingly wants to care and love for them. And after Jesus, later on in John 13, he predicts Peter's denial. He, uh, the disciples, his community is, is kind of trying to understand what's going on. Jesus is saying that he's going to die soon and everything that they thought life was going to be like with this new kingdom and kind of overthrowing this Roman empire rule that, that there's this new king named Jesus is going to rule over everything and they're going to sit with him and be like his advisors and everything that they thought was going to happen. Jesus is saying, no, it's not going to happen that way. But not only that, Jesus is saying he's going to die for them. And so now they're experiencing something different. And in John 14, the next chapter, just a few verses into it, 
This is what it says. He says, this is Jesus. He says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may also be. Jesus is like getting to their level and he's caring for them in a, in a different kind of way. And verse four says, and you know the way or, or you know the way to where I am going. You see, secondly, is Jesus was present in their grief. He was present in their grief. Jesus could have made this all about himself at this moment. Like he's there in their grief and he could have been like, you know, guys, I know that you thought things were gonna be different. I understand that. I know you thought that I was gonna be this king in, in, in the physicalness of that. Maybe you'd be the advisor, you sit to my right and left. All, all this kind of, I understand that's kind of where you're at. And I guess I understand that you're sad that I'm going to die, but I'm going to die. Can we kind of make this a little bit about me? But Jesus makes it about them. He wants to make sure that they're cared for and, and, and be in their presence, even in their grief. Now, this might hurt, and, and I understand this. I, I've been on the receiving end of a lashing. But in the church, I think we do a really bad job with grief. I think we do a really bad job with grief, like giving grief, as well as being okay to receive some love and we just don't know how to handle it. And the interesting thing about grief is it can kind of come out of nowhere. Maybe something that happened 20 years ago, there's a little reminder of it and it kind of spirals us down into a place of deep grief again. You see, grief is very complex and affects every part of who you are. And not only that, but grief can change what we think about ourselves, what we think about others, as well as what we can even think about God. Grief is complex. And, and I believe we do a terrible job at it. And I think we try to do the right things. I, I, I would like to imagine we try to say the things that you're supposed to say or what we think you're supposed to say. And a lot of times we quote Romans as if it's supposed to help us. You know, God works all things out for good. Well, that's great but how's that going to help me with that my wife just left me? In this moment, it's not, I need you just to be there for me. I, I need you to be present in my grief, not telling me God's going to work everything out. How's it going to help me while I'm struggling with the class in school? God works all things out for good. That's wonderful, but right now I'm struggling. And something else I hear quite often in the church is, Somebody will open up about what's going on on the inside or, or maybe parts of them. And, and typically what's said is, hey, I'll be praying for you, which is great. It's great. Somebody's gonna be praying for me, but what's the chances that later on the day at night or maybe later on the week, they're gonna remember me and actually start to pray for me? You know, my father-in-law, Dick Crawley, a lot of times when I tell him what's going on, a frustration or a struggle or just something that's coming up down the road, he doesn't say, hey, I'll pray for you. He says two words, let's pray. And in that moment, he stops whatever he's doing and he prays. How different would Douglas County be? How different would our church be if instead of saying, hey, I'll be praying about that, if we put a hand on a shoulder and we begin to pray? Or in that moment, we just say, let's pray. And we begin to pray in that moment. And sometimes it's not just about prayer. And sometimes it's not just about quoting scripture at the right time. Sometimes it's just about being present. Sometimes it's just about sitting. On June 4th, earlier this year, uh, my father, uh, Roger Foltz, passed away. I received a call early in the morning uh, it was my brother on the other end telling me that my dad had passed away from a heart attack. Now, up to that point, I had never experienced grief the way that you experience grief when a loved one passed away. Now, I had heard what it's like, but I had never experienced it to that point. 
And I remember after that phone call, I hung up and I'm sitting there on, on the edge of my couch and this wailing comes over me and this grief and this sadness and this brokenness and my world is shattered. Everything that was like before my father passed is now different. Well, later on that day, my wife and I, we told the kids and, um, you know, we, we had some moments where we're just sad and crying, but we're there together. And I encourage my kids because it's around graduation season to go be with their friends, go hang out. And, and so they went off to some graduation parties. My wife is grieving in her own way. She's actually in the garage cleaning. And I'm sitting on the couch watching baseball. And all of a sudden I hear the front door open and it closes and I hear some shoes coming off. And I think it's one of my kids. So I said, hello. And all of a sudden I hear, hey man. And it wasn't a voice of a man. Um, and it definitely wasn't a voice of one of my kids. And all of a sudden around the corner, this young man comes into the room and it's Austin Kwame. A 17 year old comes in my room, comes into the, uh, excuse me, the living room and he sits next to me. He doesn't say a whole lot. He just sits next to me. He asked me a few questions. Are you hungry? I said, yeah, I'll have some chips. And so he gets up and gets some potato chips. He grabs me a soda. He grabs himself a soda and he sits down next to me. And we were just watching baseball together. He asks one question, you doing okay? That was it. I said, I, yeah, I've had better days. And that's it. He hung out with me for about two, maybe three hours, just watching baseball, eating chips and drinking soda, and just with me in that moment. That's what helped me grieve, is just being there with me, being present in my grief. And it's funny because a 17-year-old got it, and too many of us don't. You see, Jesus says, let your hearts not be troubled. Jesus is present with people in their need, in the midst of their grief, of their own confusion, as well as their frustration. Even when they thought life was going to be different, Jesus was there. Man, he's so God. I, I love this. In, in the Old Testament, there's, there's a book called Psalm. And in chapter 34, I, I love 34 verse 18. This is what it says. It says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. He is close to us when we're brokenhearted. Jesus met them in their grief, in their pain, in their trouble, in their confusion and was there. Now, when we have a community on and with a purpose, we grieve with those who are grieving. We show up and we just love. Now, to kind of look into the next scene, what's going on is Jesus uh, then leaves this upper room with three of his closest friends, and there's four of them. They head to this garden called Gethsemane. And Jesus, at this point, is about ready. It's, it's, it's almost crunch time. He, he says, my hour has come. And so we're at this point where things are rapidly going to change. And three of his closest friends were supposed to go with him to keep watch and to pray. And let's see what happens. In, in Mark chapter 14, verses 32 through 34, it says, And they went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly troubled. Verse 34, and he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death, remain here and watch. So he gives them these instructions and he goes actually like a stone's throw away and he kneels down and, and Jesus is, is broken, he, his, he is shattered and he's having this conversation with his father and, and he's saying, you know what? Let your will be done. If things could be different, but let your wills will be done. And he gets up and he heads back to his, his community, his disciples, his friends. And let's see what's going on. In verse 37, he came and found them sleeping. He found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. 
And again, he went away and prayed, saying the same words. So again, he leaves his disciples, his community, his friends, and he goes back and he starts to pray and he starts to pray to God again. God, what help me, give me what I need. And then he gets back up, catch this. And again, he came and found them asleep for their eyes were heavy and they did not know what to answer him. And verse 41 says, and he came the third time and it happened again and again and again. But here's the thing about Jesus is Jesus was authentic with his community. He was, I I love the word real. He was real. He was saying, this is going on in my life and I need you. Jesus in this moment was with his closest friends, Peter, James, and John. And as hours approaching, Judas is gathering the Roman soldiers to take Jesus away. And Jesus asks his friends to come and pray for him, to be with them. Jesus is feeling broken and sad and and just trying to figure this thing out and trusting in the Father, totally trusting in the Father. But he has this feeling where Judas is betraying him. Peter is just, Peter, he's arrogant. And Thomas is still unknowing, like, is he really... God or not. And so Jesus is in this place and he's shattered and he's broken. And it's almost like he's on death row and he's totally trusting, but he needs his friends to step up. These are his closest friends and close friends are supposed to be there in the midst of troubles, in the midst of trials are supposed to be there. Now, where do we find them? We find them sleeping. Now, I have been known to drift off or not off in important moments. There's definitely meetings where I have my phone and it's easy to kind of shift into something else. And and, um, I've definitely nodded off on some things that I should be paying attention to. Now, if you look at uh, the triumphal entry, like when Jesus enters into Jerusalem, there's this amazing thing that's gonna happen. And, and so there's this excitement. They're gonna win the week. Things are gonna be totally different. And it's excitement and a full week of things going on. And on the last night, he has this emotional dinner with his friends. And I can only imagine the heaviness of that night. And Jesus is asking them to come outside in the cool of the evening at night to pray. And I can, I understand why they're sleeping. I understand it was an emotional evening, a full week. No wonder they were tired. But Jesus is needing his friends. Jesus is approaching a time when the weight of the world's sin will be on his shoulders. And for the first and only time coming up is that he's gonna not feel the love of his father. Jesus needs his friends in this moment because authentic uh, community looks like this. It looks like vulnerability. It's vulnerable. It's letting everyone know in your your close knit friends, what's going on. We see this. He says, and he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and keep watch. Jesus talked about things you don't normally share, especially men saying, hey, this is, this is hard. I need you there for me. Jesus telling him that something is coming. I need your help. I want you there. I have uh, two close friends here and I call them tag as Thomas and Kyle. And, and these guys, um, we meet together, we read books together, we, we talk about real things, what's really going on in our life. How can we pray for each other? And Jesus is looking for this with his friends. Be there for me. He's being vulnerable, being open. And Tag and Kyle and I, we're vulnerable, we're open. We're saying, what do you see in me? Secondly, we see, we see this, authentic community looks like accountability. It's this, holding each other accountable. And, and I love this. In, in verse 37, it says, and he came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? We see Jesus coming to the disciples, his community, his friends multiple times, but we never see him berating them. We never see them raking them across a coal. We never see him yelling. We never see that kind of emotion because he's saying, you guys say that you're my closest friends. I need you. Are you going to show up? Are you going to do your thing? Tag and Kyle and I, we run. Like we enjoy running. We're the weird people that like to run. 
And when one of us hasn't been running for a while, we hold each other accountable. We say, hey, I thought you're going to step up. I thought you were going to like, come on, you can do this. You can do this. Let's run together. But even on more serious things, we hold each other accountable when we're reading our books together. We're holding each other accountable when we're reading uh, the Bible together. We're having someone speak into our life as well as holding someone else to what they're saying they're going to do. You see, authentic community looks like uh, with accountability. And thirdly, it's encouragement. It's encouragement. In, in Mark 14, verse 38, Jesus says, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, we see Jesus more concerned about his friends, even in his time of need. He's saying, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. He's reminding his friends to stay strong, to pray, And for Tag and Kyle and I, we encourage each other, even in the midst of trouble. One thing Jesus understood was after the cross and the ascension, the Holy Spirit was going to change his friends. And they won't be the same people they are at that moment, but he's giving them encouragement. So for you and for me, if we find authentic friendships, we need at least these three things. Being vulnerable, being held accountable, as well as holding others accountable And lastly, giving encouragement. The last part I find very amazing in this story is that Jesus knew where his source came from. His source came from his father. And we see this in this story in the garden where he goes to his father to pray. He comes back to his friends and his friends are sleeping and he's vulnerable. He's giving them encouragement. He's holding them. He's doing those things. But where do we see him go back to? His father again and again and again. And if you look throughout the gospel, Jesus has this this connection, this community with his father again and again and again, because Jesus understood something that a lot of us don't. He understood that where his source of strength comes from, too many of us, we're up and down and we're up and down because of our relationships with our friends, with the people we connect with. But Jesus understood where real community comes from. The Father who gives you love, lavishes love upon you. And I believe that once we start to see God, not as somebody far away, but somebody who has a connection and wants a community with us, then when, when our friends kind of move us away and, or isn't as close as we think they should be, or, or they say those things like, well, I'll be praying for you, that we know where to go to. We know where our source is and our source is with our father in heaven because your friends are going to let you down, but your father in heaven will never let you down. And Jesus understood that. And we see that over and over and over in his life. So I'm going to hand off to the campus pastors. You guys have a great week and we'll see you soon. Hey guys, thanks for hanging out for a few extra minutes. Um, I, I want to encourage you in a couple other ways. Um, let us be a community that not only just gets along about whatever sports team or hunting, fishing, maybe shopping, or uh, just kind of getting together, drink coffee. Let us be a community that is on purpose and with a purpose. Um, a community that cares, that is present, as well as authentic. And I want to ask you this question, is what is standing in the way for you to be in that kind of community, is it pride? Are you struggling with pride and you're like, I I just can't open myself up to someone like that? Is it your time? You're so so busy that you don't have the time to open up to anyone. Is is it past hurts? Maybe in the past you had opened yourself up to to a community of people or or to a friend, but, but they said something or they did something and you have this hurt in your past because of what had happened. I want you to have a little bit of EQ and kind of figure out what is standing in the way for you to have that kind of community. Let me pray for you. Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you for a chance to open up your word and to see how you were in community with your closest friends, with your disciples. Thank you that you're authentic. Thank you that you're real. Thank you that you change lives. And thank you that you want us to experience community 
the way that you have designed it for. Jesus, I pray that uh, today will be a day that we can start uh, trusting in you so that we can start opening ourselves up to someone else and telling people what's going on on the inside, the real stuff, and not just anybody and everybody, but people that we can begin to trust about what's going on. Jesus, I pray that you change us from the inside out. And we give you thanks for this. In your name we pray, amen. The very last thing I want to kind of bring us back to is, is this missional moment. And throughout this uh, uh, sermon, we saw these five things take place. You saw the beginning with prayer. You saw the listening. You saw the eating, the serve, as well as the share. And I wanna encourage you to share. Sometimes when we talk about share, we, we, we instantly think of our salvation story when we came to know Christ, which is an important thing to share, but also is important about what's really going on, about the battles, about the struggles, and about the vit victories. What is really going on? And so my hope and my encouragement for you is to share the real stuff with your community, with your world and see how God changes you from the inside out. Again, thanks for hanging out with us and we'll see you guys really soon. Bye guys.